Welcome to Hardcore Honeys, where we take our full court NBA hottest takes. And we got featuring Jade and Penny with your moderator, TJ, who will just try to keep control with these two while we go with our takes. Hey there, Hardcore Honey fans. Got a new episode coming this week. Uh, this week we got Jade in here, and then we have a special guest here, one of... Uh, one of our better writers from the Belly Up page, uh, Chaka. He's coming in, helping out. Um, Penny is not here this week, but so he's replacing her. And he's going to come in with just as hot takes as Penny does. So this week, we thought a little bit of the discussion about fantasy teams. So, uh, Jay, do you do much with fantasy? Not in terms of teams. I did start playing NBA Pick'ems this year. Um, so that's technically fantasy, but it's not, hasn't have anything to do with individual players okay. too much. It's matchups. They have the prime time picks too, which can be player related, but I don't know. I don't have time for all that. So I just do the six picks. Do the six picks. Every gotcha. Um, Chaka, do you do anything fantasy related? Once upon a time, I used to have my fantasy by season long fantasy basketball team. Uh, I, I haven't engaged in that in quite some time. What I did start to get into a little bit was the daily fantasy. Okay. And yep. it's definitely a different game for folks that are used to season long versus daily. And I definitely mm-hmm. think it impacts how people kind of look at basketball players individually. Because mm-hmm. uh, that daily fantasy, man, if you just picked Bradley Beal the last couple of days, <laughs> he just went off, right? And, uh, yeah, he's it's definitely with that. <laughs> Absolutely. It's definitely different than kind of season-long fantasy for sure. Yeah. I got myself my own fantasy league this year. I was I was really into it right away. Um, but then I got hit with the injury bug real hard. So, um, yeah, I've kind of dropped a lot. I was first in my league, and now I'm, like, second to last. So I've kind of lost a little bit interest now with it just because I dropped <laughs> so badly. But, I mean... I'm- it's- doesn't help anthony davis is out every other game good old first <laughs> overall pick great pick. i'm you, hoping you it's not really one of those st- leagues where you get a tattoo where you come in last because that would no be that is no it's no 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 no. It, luck luckily how did you not see it coming with anthony davis though i i gambled <laughs> luca luca was my third round pick with that so I That's was a solid in the third round. Wow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. He slipped to me. And I picked him primarily because I'm just a huge fan of him. And I was like, he's still going to have a great year. But what he's doing now, I didn't think it was going to be that great. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, can't complain with that action. Too bad he was out for a long time. Well, okay. Let's get with that first question with it all for with the fantasy stuff. Um, so I'll start off with you, Jade. So has like has fantasy sports shifted fandoms now for people from being more of a team driven thing to now a more player oriented thing just because you focus more on the player because of the fantasy than as the whole as a team. Think that's changed at all? I think it has. I think about this a lot, especially the last two seasons with all the uproar over Kawhi's load management. I don't remember growing up watching basketball being that aware of a starter not playing a game. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I can think to kind of attribute that to is the fact that fantasy sports is so focused, uh, the big chunk of it is focused on, on... the player like the daily stuff most of it is player related so when your player is out everybody i think a lot a big chunk of nba fans that play fantasy notice it a lot more than the than when i was younger before fantasy sports blew up all right so you're thinking so you're thinking more of the load management has now affected more of fandoms for players than teams yeah well the load management but i think i think if if you're going to do the chicken or the egg thing Mm -hmm. i think fantasy sports is pushing that focus on individual players okay okay Okay. yeah 
Okay, that's what. Okay, okay. Um, well, then, and then I'll just swing this qu- the same question over to you, Chaka. Do you think, yeah, fantasy has it shifted fandoms from teams to now players, just players? It's interesting because I, when I grew up watching the NBA, I always felt like it was kind of a an individual league anyway, and I feel like the NBA kind of markets itself in that way. So, for instance, you could be a kid who grows up in New York City, but you can root for Michael Jordan, right? Mm -hmm. And so fantasy, in my mind, hasn't shifted that perspective as much as I feel like it's maybe elevated some players who are really good fantasy players but aren't necessarily on winning teams. So, for instance, I would imagine there are people out there who believe that a guy like Zach Levine is having an incredible season, which he is from an individual standpoint, Mm -hmm. but the Bulls suck. And (laughs) he's got to account for that as well, right? I mean, And so I I do wonder how much maybe it shifted some of those perspectives. I remember growing up and seeing uh, guys who were great individuals on bad teams, and we would ding them because they were on those bad teams. And I do wonder how much fantasy has maybe – cause us to overlook some of that a little bit just because yeah. guys are putting up great fantasy numbers. P- players might get uh, a little bit more. Um, that's where you can get more of the overratedness from it. Cause I'm a Levine fan. He came from my Timberwolves, but he can get buckets, but wow, that's kind of it with it all. And like a fantasy standpoint, yeah, he looks great, but that does not, it's empty numbers, which would you say uh, another question? Are fantasy is fantasy sports causing or um, helping say players on bad teams um, since they put up empty numbers, good numbers on a bad team? Does that though affect their fandom? Then do p- people pay attention to that player more? Say they're in a small market, but they're still doing well. Chaka, do you think that affects uh, more of a player oriented league too? More people know the players. I definitely think so. I think that it specifically the example that you pointed out, which there are certain teams that just don't make it on television on a regular basis. And so obviously fantasy gives those players a platform to be able to show out and they, maybe their name is in the paper a little bit more than it would be. I think a guy like Damian Lillard, especially early on in his career versus where he has been because Portland's had some playoff success early in his career, he will, I mean, he couldn't make an all-star team because the West was loaded with point guards and he was playing in Portland and people didn't see him. So mm-hmm. they wouldn't go into the stadiums and cast votes for him. They wouldn't go online and cast votes for him. But if you keep scoring 25 points a game, all of a sudden people want to talk about your name a little bit more. The next thing you know, you got a signature shoe. All of a sudden you're Dame mm-hmm. Dollar, right? I mean, versus uh, taking it back to the fact that you're a Timberwolves fan, TJ. I remember growing up in New York City, I actually uh, – I played against Stephon Marbury in high school. And I remember people saying that Stephon Marbury got you 20 points that didn't help your team win and 10 assists that made nobody better. And it was a ding that he was a 2010 guy. And I think that now you look at a player, if a guy's putting up 20 and 10, man, he's helping my fantasy team. He's helping my daily fantasy. There's definitely a big bump that kind of comes along with that. And Damian Little, I think, is a prime example. Okay, yeah, that's a good one. Um, so just speaking of small teams or whatever, uh, just the team things, do super teams uh, affect the value of a player? Um, say in fantasy sports, like say, for example, the Miami Heat Big Three. Chris Bosh was, Jade knows, was 20 and 10 player. Mm-hmm. Great talent, then goes to Miami, and he goes down to 17 and 8. So... Because of that, do players lose or do the super teams make the players less valuable on the fantasy sports, Um, Jade? Yeah, I mean, and I think this kind of connects to the previous question, too, where you were talking about the other the other end where you've got players putting up big numbers on losing teams. It's kind of it's kind of the same effect, right? It's the team that they're playing for affects their ability to make to have lots of points and lots of assists or not. So Chris Bosh coming from a then very much struggling Raptors team to Miami where he's now playing with 
two of the best players to ever play. It changes things. And so I think both of those things skew things in both directions. Whether or not that's something that needs to be addressed is a different question because that that's always going to happen. You move a player to a different team, his stats are going to change. That's just the nature of the sport. Okay, yeah, that's that is a very true thing with that. Um, but and then also just swinging back to that load management thing again, Jade, you were bringing up. Uh, mm. So with the load management, um, that obviously affects uh, fantasy every day for players because. For me, at least, I won't know. It's always a game time decision if the player is going to play yeah. with load management or not. And if people are seeing that happening more, could that just have people just stop playing fantasy basketball knowing that, oh, I don't know if I can get the players I want or if they're even going to be useful. So um, I don't you- think... I don't think that's going to happen. I'm going to tell you why. I think people love to have something to bitch about. So, (laughs) as long as as long as there's the opportunity to play, people are still going to play, and people love to complain about stuff. So that just gives them like another thing to complain about. And I understand that it's a nuisance, I guess, for people. But, like, I have a much broader theory on on all of that stuff. Um, I don't I don't think I don't think NBA basketball compared to other sports, I don't think they play enough of their available players on a game to game basis. Yeah, because I was talking to a buddy of mine that's into hockey and we were talking about this. And he was he pointed out to me that teams that have um three full lines to play in hockey are considered to be at an advantage because they can play that third line, their entire first line, their best players can sit during the game, not have to miss entire games during the season. And then if something happens late in the game where they're behind or they need a goal, they can go back to that first line and they're well rested. We've got 15 guys available on a roster I think 12 per game that can suit up if, if I remember correctly mm-hmm. and we're playing nine or 10 and then it might come down even more than that in the playoffs. So like, I think across the, the league, we need to be going deeper into benches because that makes for less, it's going to make for less injuries for the first and second line guys. Yep. And it's, going to eliminate some of the need for a person like Kawhi Leonard. Um, Boston's talking about having some load management with their guys coming down the stretch. It's going to eliminate some of that if you're using all of your available players as a rule throughout the season, even if they're they're not your best players. If every team was doing that, it would balance out. Yeah, I was just about to ask then, so do you think the super teams are actually kind of um, affecting how just the bench is in general when it comes to talent wise. Yeah. And because like, I think it's kind of a big vicious circle because so many people are playing fantasy sports. It's a big issue for somebody like Kawhi Leonard to sit out on, especially on a big nationally televised game. So because of that, he's playing more minutes over the course of his career instead of playing more at the end of the bench guys. And then it starts over again. Um, with the load management, um, with the star players though, couldn't that though help the bench players then get more experience because be, oh, well, Kawhi's out doing his load management thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, this gives the guy that was actually back at the bench, he at least is getting second unit minutes. So Mm -hmm. he's able to show and just kind of at least work out what he has done in practice so Um, i got three words for you on that golden state warriors well well, (sighs) those guys are better than they would have been otherwise because they are getting to play 
Oh, yes. No, yeah, I get, yep. I get that. Well, that's right now, that's my Timberwolves. We have five G-leaguers right now, and that's what's going to be like for the rest of the season. <laughs> Which, they're all killing it right now, by the way. They're better than our... our we have three G-leaguers that are undrafted that we picked up, and they're actually performing way better than our actual draft picks. So, I don't know if that has to do with scouting. I don't know what happened with that, but... And we do have, Tim Wills now do have a Hollywood connection. One of the G-leaguers we have is Cousins to Lucas, for those who watch Stranger Things. Lucas from Stranger Things, they're cousins, so. <laughs> so, Jack, yep. because yep. you so were not. So, take that, Jack Nicholson from Taylor L.A. Take that, Jack <laughs> Because you were filling in for Taylor last time, you don't know that we cannot do a recording without Taylor going off on some kind of trip. About the Timberwolves. Well, how so now you're <laughs> Chaka, I guess I don't know. What's your what's your team, Chaka? God, I don't want to do this again. Do I have to admit that I'm a Knicks fan again? I feel like I did that already. <laughs> I, I did this already. Hi, my name is Shaka. I root for the Knicks. Hi, Shaka. Well, you know what I mean? I feel bad because uh, they're not very good. Obviously, uh, especially talking to a Raptors fan, you guys have a great squad, championship yeah. rings. The Knicks stink perpetually. But uh, that's why I root for. I grew up in New York City, so I grew up rooting for the Knicks. You know what? I respect that, though. I respect it. It's going through <laughs> tough times, and you still watch them. I feel Absolutely. the pain. Feel the but pain. You know, you know that's part of the problem, right? That's why Dolan's never going to sell the team, because you keep making him money. Well, I mean... He was a billionaire before he bought the Knicks. It's I, I don't know that he, he didn't, didn't buy them. He inherited he, them. He inherited them exactly before yeah, his family. That's how he got it. His, yeah. his, fam what his family. His, his family <laughs> owns MSG and Cablevision, and so it's a lot of ties that go into. That. And once again, he was a billionaire before. I don't know that Nick fan supporting him is going to make him sell. He's now looking to buy a stake in the Mets, not to go into too much of a tangent, but um, oh, yeah, I mean, no, he had, he had I was a ton gonna of say, Tangents is kind of how we do it around here. No, no worries. <laughs> I, I did want to backtrack a little bit and just talk about the piece around load management because yeah, go for it. theory is a little bit, it's, it's, it's interesting to me, the idea of kind of hockey lines and rotating. And so I'll take it back to something else I'm familiar with, which is college basketball. I, I went to the University of Kentucky. The University of Kentucky went undefeated with this roster of 15 guys, and we were rotating guys, and eventually someone got hurt, so the rotations got limited. But the University mm -hmm. of Kentucky back in 2015 went undefeated into the Final Four, playing as yep. many guys as possible, then lost to Wisconsin. And one of the key pieces that John Calipari took away from that season, he said, I will never rotate that many guys because the reality is, is that your best players lose minutes when you're rotating that many players. And so the idea of kind of hockey style rotations, I don't know that I can wholly get behind, even though I understand what Jade's point is, which is you can obviously, you can, you can reconsider load management by playing more players. And then I think about, a team like the Knicks. The, our problem isn't that we can't play more players. Our problem is that we play more players. They all suck. So <laughs> it's, it's all it's all relative, right? So like Golden State is a great example because they did a great job of scouting, finding guys who fit Steve Kerr's system. And of course, they have big stars up at the top. I think that Toronto does an incredible job. I told Jade a couple of weeks ago, I wanted the Knicks to steal Masai Ujiri. He does a great job of drafting talent for the roster and for the coach that he has. And I don't think that every NBA team does that. And so what about Bill Jackson, I, <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that was obviously a mistake and he, but he collected his money, which was great. But I mean, the Knicks are, are I do think that Phil Jackson is apropos because he didn't do a great job of putting talent together with the exception of Kristaps Porzingis. So the and reality the one that messed that up too. Absolutely. I don't <laughs> think that every a NBA team, has the front office to put together the type of talent that says, hey, we can consistently on a night-in, night-out basis play 10 guys and get away with it for an entire season. I think that most teams would struggle very much to do that, which is why they play their big guys, their big names, because they're trying to just stay in games. 
Um, mm-hmm. I would love for the Knicks to be at a point where we had 10 guys who we felt like we could throw out there and consistently compete night in, night out. But the reality is we probably have three guys that we could throw out there and try to compete, which is why we don't compete. And I think that a lot of NBA teams are in that boat more so than the other side where they have 10 guys, 12 guys, so they really can throw out there and compete night in, night out. Okay, so I have two. One thing I wanted to go back to your Kentucky story. Mm -hmm. Because I'm missing the piece where the after having such a successful season doing that deep rotation, why that was why the decision was still I would never do it again when it was successful. So it, just keep in mind that at the University of Kentucky, success is relative, right? So making okay. a Final Four is not winning a national championship, which means it's not as successful as it could have been. And that's how Kentucky yeah. fans look at it, having won eight national championships and consistently trying to get number nine. So that's one piece to understand is that it's a jaded perspective on success. And Kentucky fans don't always get that, but I feel like I'm a rational Kentucky fan, so I kind of get that. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> the other piece as well is by playing as many players as John Calipari did. You know a guy who didn't get a lot of minutes? Devin Booker. No. You know the only mm-hmm. guy who could keep Devin Booker under 25 points per game? John Calipari. And that's because he didn't play him in college. It's the <laughs> argument that they made with Dean Smith and Michael Jordan. The only guy who could keep Jordan under 30 a game was Dean Smith because he only played him so many minutes. And so with Kentucky, when you had all of that talent, they were playing – as many players as they could, and then certain guys just didn't get the opportunity to really shine, and then they go to that next level, and then they shine incredibly, which, if you actually look at Kentucky, that's kind of their history. You get a guy who, you know, they're they're pretty good in college, but then all of a sudden, they get to the NBA, and oh my goodness, I, I didn't know Carl Anthony Towns was, was this type of player. Well, what I guess he was the number one pick in the draft, but at Kentucky, he averaged like 12 points a game. Uh-huh. And the you get him to the NBA, he's a 25 and 10 guy, right? Um, so it's, it's while you have a lot of talent, does the talent really get to flourish if they're not on the floor seeing enough minutes? And that's really the question to ask for Kentucky. I think the NBA question is more of, do you have enough guys that are good enough to say, hey, that 12th guy deserves eight minutes a night that mm-hmm. Kawhi Leonard doesn't get? You know what? So- I think I'd rather get Kawhi those eight. I have an answer for that, too, from the Raptors. And it's the one thing that the Raptors are doing better than any team in the league. You mentioned the development. Part of their development is their G League team. It's half an hour to 40-minute drive away from where the Raptors play. Um, The coach is always – the head coach of the Raptor 905 has been always pulled from the bench of the Raptors. Jerry Stackhouse? It's, it's been Stackhouse. Um, okay. It's J- Jamma Malalela, I think, right now. So assistant coaches that were working with whoever the head coach was, was involved in the organization. And that has made all the difference. All of the guys that have come up in the last few years in the Raptors that everyone was like, who's that? Played in the G League team. And because they're so closely affiliated, they're developing talent specifically to be able to pull out of the G League and bring into the Raptors system. And that's why it's always so seamless. And that's why the Raptors can play so deep into their bench because those guys are getting the run because they're playing real minutes in the G League. Pascal played there. Freddie played there. Norm Powell. um, DeLon Wright, who's out playing well in Dallas now. Um. So that's, I think that's kind of the piece. And I would be surprised if we don't see more teams g- seeing what the Raptors have been able to do with very low draft picks. Don't start to incorporate that more because that's really the difference between are, are the guys at the end of the bench good enough or are they not? And what I would argue there is just that I think that that's where Masai Ujiri's genius comes into play. He is able, and the scouting department of the Raptors, I mean, it's obviously not solely Masai. They Mm -hmm. are able to see guys that have that potential and bring them in and say, hey, yes, let's develop them. 
I think yeah. Fred Van Vliet is a great example because I believe that Fred Van Vliet started with the Knicks. <laughs> I believe that we were the ones who got him first, and that we <laughs> couldn't we couldn't figure out what to do with him. And now all of a sudden, Toronto picks him up, and you see how incredible a player he is because he was given the opportunity to develop. And I think mm-hmm. that most front offices are short sighted in that way. And I think you can look to some specific front offices that really do it well. Toronto is absolutely one. San Antonio traditionally yep. has been one. Dallas is another one. Just about to say that does too. as well. So um, I think that those franchises stand out. Indiana's another one. They just stand out because they do that better, which is why those teams tend to be deeper. And then you have some other teams that try to do it another way. If you're the Lakers, you can go out and get free agents. So why do I need to develop the 12th guy? True. Absolutely. Um, and the Knicks have tried to do it that way. We're just so piss poor that we can't. <laughs> well, when you have nine power forwards on the squad. <laughs> I mean, you guys got my boy Taj Gibson. I love him. So I, I don't know how well he's been doing well for you guys, but I love I, he, Taj Gibson. The, the Knicks are awful in general. Taj has done the best that he can, considering the things that he's been given. I Perfect. feel bad for him. You know what? That's all I want to hear. He's trying his best. He's putting his heart out there. Absolutely. So since we're talking about a Nick with a Knicks fan, what do you think about the new direction they're going in? Um, it feels very similar to things that I've seen in the past. That's so. what I was thinking, too. When I heard that, I saw on Twitter that um, he was – who's who did they hire? I forget his so, name. So the um, – oh, gosh. Now I'm forgetting the name of the <laughs> new GM. But um, Steve Stout is the guy – who went on first take and talked about being the Knicks version of Drake, which is... Yes, that's what uh, I was thinking of. Let me just say that when, once you say that, like, I, I don't even <laughs> understand personal perception that people have of themselves. This goes right back to the article that you wrote, Jade, on Belly Up, the, one of the Dunce Awards that you gave out. When Kyrie Irving compares himself to Martin Luther King Jr., it's just a lack of self-awareness at that point. So yeah. Steve Stout... <laughs> When, I get it. You were you were big in hip hop music in the late '90s. That does not give you the right to compare yourself to Drake in 2020. So and it's also, that lack of awareness that that's just the Knicks in a nutshell. And so it just feels yeah. like something that we tried before. We we fire coaches, we hire a new one, we fire the GM, we get a new one, and we hope upon hope that something will be different. But the thing <laughs> that can never change is what we talked about earlier: the fact that Dolan is a billionaire. And he was a billionaire before he got into this. He will be a billionaire when he leaves it. So he gets to decide when he wants to leave. Uh, It's not like, you know, the fact that the Knicks aren't winning is impacting his pocketbook. He also owns the Rangers, who have had some some semblance of success in hockey. So it's not like he's looking at every sports franchise that he touches, you know, just disintegrating. And he just... You know, he makes money on top of money. That's why he's looking to potentially get involved with the Mets. And so it's a, it's a, it's tough being a Nick fan because I know that as long as James Dolan is at the helm, it's very unlikely that I'll see any semblance of success with the franchise that I've been rooting for since I was a kid. Is yeah, he when even I- a basketball fan, really? So, uh, TJ, one of the articles that I wrote was on uh, <laughs> the bellies. I gave out awards. And I kid you not, Google the name James Dolan. And you will see so many pictures of him just looking like a sour puss with his arms crossed front row at MSG. It's crazy. It feels like he doesn't enjoy basketball. But what I honestly think it is, is that he gets so much heck from New York Knicks fans about not winning. He just doesn't enjoy being at the games because when he goes to the games, they chant, you know, sell the team, sell Sell the the team. team. And he's too much of a narcissist to just not go to the games. Absolutely. I mean, he's he's a new he's New York social, so he's yeah. This is he a, this to, be to be there. seen as the front he row. Like, he needs to be yeah. there. I did one of when I first started writing in July. Um, it's probably my fourth through eighth articles I ever wrote was about the Knicks, and it started because the NBA announced the Christmas Day schedule for 2019, and Knicks fans lost it on Twitter. And as a Raptors fan that we finally got to play and host on Christmas, initially I went into it like, really, you guys, you're going to be upset about this? Like, you think you deserve to be playing this day? So I started it, and it was only (laughs) intending to be one article 
that was like the bigger question is how have the Knicks managed to be this bad for this long? Because like I knew about it in my periphery of NBA knowledge, but I hadn't really like dug into it a lot. And so I start writing this article. I start researching it. And I said to my editor, I'm like, I think this is going to have to be more than one article. And it ended up being four articles that were at least 3,000 words each. And I had to leave. <laughs> so you're writing full I dissertations, I see. I Your thesis is almost done that, there, like, Jade, then. I couldn't even cover everything. But so it was interesting, though, because when I went into it, I was very snarky towards Knicks fans. But by the time I finished, I was like, crap, I actually feel really bad because I understand that it's not their fault. I also came to the conclusion that the reason the Knicks get to play on Christmas, even though they stink, is because it's the commissioner throwing Knicks fans a bone because he can't control anything else. So at least he can give you a Christmas Day game. Well, also think of all the celebrity draw, though, that comes on a Christmas Day game and in New York City. Like, I can still see why it's an easy revenue for the NBA having, oh, courtside seats are going to be $10,000. Well, don't worry. Every other celebrity can write that check out instantly. Yeah, but that's, I mean, I don't think I would, I think every place they played on Christmas this year, all of them not being New York, sold out. That is true. That's true. But MSG well, is such a higher Well, yeah, MSG I, doesn't sell out really in the sense that, I mean, it's a very expensive ticket. So yeah, that's it's, it's not necessarily unusual for a Knicks game to not sell out. The Knicks will not sell out and still outdraw pretty much every team in the NBA in terms of revenue just because of ticket prices. And that's just raw dollars. So that doesn't take into account the fact that a dollar in New York is worth less than a dollar in Oklahoma City who's selling out all their games. True. Sure. That's And that's where you get the small market. Well, you got... Timberwolves, they marked up their prices after one good season in 15, 14 years. And <laughs> they've marked it up so much, and they've lost so much revenue due to the fan base being like, I'm not renewing season tickets. So now they're offering up, okay, you'll still pay that regular season ticket price you had before, but you get 50% off the team store, you get 50% off all food, you get 50% off all drinks, and then like another and a couple other perks with it. So I was like, oh, now you're getting cre- now now you're getting creative on how to at least to at least make up for screwing up ticket prices for I I had season tickets and then I thought of renewing them and then when I heard what they did, I was like, nope, can't even think about doing that. <laughs> can't even think about doing that. I'm just like we're going to have a bad season. I know something's going to go wrong. No way can Timberwolves have a consistent good amount of time of good playing. That's just, that's <laughs> not the way that's not Minnesota way. <laughs> we're average to below average. And then Timberwolves were just bad. You guys just need another that's Kevin important. Garnett. You just get another Kevin Garnett back there. And then all of a sudden things change. Oh yeah. We'll just get a top 10 defender of all time. One of the I best. Power say, forwards. Yeah. I'll get right on that one too. That should be easy. Piece of cake. <laughs> Right hey, on that one. Let's get the let's get that one in a generational talent and someone that actually wants to be here. Yeah. See, that's the thing. That's another reason why these smaller market teams need to copy of the Raptors development. Because nobody wanted to stay in Toronto either. So what did we do? We grew our own all-star. And he's gonna be loyal to us as long as we want him. That's true. Well, I'm- I, to be fair, so this is now, again, I'm being objective. I am not a Raptors fan, so Jade wants to tear my throat out after this. She's more than welcome to do that. But uh, <laughs> the, to, be, to be fair, the, the Raptors did grow their all-stars and could not get really to where they wanted to be until they got Kawhi, who was not homegrown. He was fully developed by San Antonio, came in and finished things off. So it Ooh. feels like, I mean, well, I mean, that's the reality of it. Like, though, right? I don't that... disagree with that. I don't disagree with that. Somebody threw that at me on Twitter yesterday. And my answer to that was every team that's ever won a first championship has a, it didn't happen until story. Absolutely. And so I'm not, 
again, I don't want to diminish the Raptors championship. But what I do want to point out as well is that even with the development that the Raptors went through, it took bringing in that outside guy to finish the job, to finish the deal. So to me, a more, I mean, uh, if you're going to look at a team to say, hey, this is the way we need to do it. To me, the classic example of small market is San Antonio yep. versus Toronto because San Antonio was able to get the generational talent that pushed them over the top twice. They got it with David Robinson. Then they got it with Tim Duncan. That's the generational talent versus what Toronto was able to do was consistently be successful with an incredible backcourt. And it took moving that piece uh, in DeMar DeRozan to go get the better guy, which was Kawhi. And unfortunately, they couldn't keep him in Toronto to see, hey, could this thing kind of continue in the same vein? So now they have to go back to what's been pretty darn successful for them, which is drafting their talent, developing it, keeping it home. I would love to see if they're able to push and win the championship with a guy like Pascal Siakam winning the MVP, because then that would really cement that Toronto is the blueprint versus San Antonio being the blueprint in my mind in terms of small market. And yeah, and I don't, I don't necessarily disagree with that. I think it's going to take until after the postseason for me to really be able to have some "I told you so" moments. Huh. Um, I'll be but waiting. the fact that <laughs> the expectation for everybody outside of the Toronto fan base and outside of the people who cover Toronto professionally in the media, like um, the broadcasters, the local outlets, and all that stuff. Everyone expected Toronto was going to take a huge step back this season. And already... That is something I will give you guys. Already that hasn't happened. We have a better record at this point than we had last year with Kawhi. Well, Kawhi was doing load management then last year, wasn't he, more? Yeah, but we only lost five, five games of the 22 he sat out. Oh. Well... How much of an impact, though, of Marcus Gasol and Serge Ibaka, who you guys got through trades and off-season acquisitions? Marcus Gasol is, he's a defensive piece. He's not, like, if he's on the floor, he's the fifth option offensively, pretty oh, much no yeah. matter who else is on the floor. Huh? I was going to say, but it's st still a vital piece, though. To, do you think yeah, that you guys could have won without him? He's definitely an important piece, but he he's he wasn't and he's not a Kawhi, right? He's on the tail end of his career. He's 34 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, and then Serge is, is Serge is playing the best basketball of his career in Toronto. Yes. This season especially. Um so, I mean, I would make the argument that his coming there has been better for him than any place else he's been to, even though we didn't draft him. I guess, yeah, you you guys were able to mold the best talent out of him. So, yeah, yeah I guess I get that. Um, swinging back to quick, a fantasy thing again. So, we're, going, we're talking about revenue for the teams. Mm. Does fantasy sports affect the revenue and the team in the games the fact that well, oh, this player's coming to town. I'm making sure I can go to see how my best player on my fantasy team does. Or do you think that doesn't come into play as much? Chaka. Chaka. Yeah, that's interesting. So I I definitely think that when it comes to the best players in the NBA, you're going to come see them regardless of whether or not they're on your fantasy team. Where I do think that potentially fantasy could push revenue is actually in some of that merchandising piece. So in other words, am I more likely to buy... Pascal Siakam's jersey if he's on my fantasy team and then all of a sudden he's in the top 10 in terms of sales maybe something like that more than the actual in stadium I, I do think that the other place where it could potentially impact is television versus in stadium so in other words am I more likely to buy a league pass oh. when I play fantasy <laughs> I probably am because I want to see my guys and the reality is most of my guys aren't going to be on my local team that I root for. So I think that those avenues in terms of revenue generation, fantasy has probably had some semblance of an impact. And if we you know, did the research and the study, we could probably 
prove correlation in some way, shape, or form versus guys coming in town. In other words, if I got LeBron on my fantasy team, guess what? I want to see him anyway, right? Anthony sure. Davis, I want to see anyway. So the best of the best, I'm probably going to try to get those tickets regardless of whether or not they're on my fantasy team. That's true. That's very true. Um, I didn't think of the merch part, but I did think of TV immediately. Yes. Especially those like those national games when you know who is sitting at right it's it's been a huge topic for conversation um the other thing that that is going to affect so initially we were going to have um an episode with the woman responsible for nba top shot which is the collectibles digital collectibles platform based on blockchain that the nba is launching plug there and, top shot yeah that <laughs> would be Part of the reason the NBA jumped on that is that because that's going to be a, a profit generator for the league and for the players. Um, the NBA and the Players Association are both um, involved in bringing that company on board, Dapper Labs, and working on it. So that's part of the reason that they liked that idea is because the platform is based on collecting moments rather than picking a player, drafting a player. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be able to purchase a uh, Damian Lillard buzzer beating three. You're going to be able to purchase um, Derek Jones Jr. in-game dunk. Like the actual moment is what you're, what the currency is. And I don't exactly, know how that could boost everyone. Right. Yes. So that was a, a big part of why the players association liked that idea is because you've got guys who have those moments and have them regularly. Like, I think of Grievous Vasquez for the Raptors a few years ago. Yep. He was infuriating to watch play. He was terrible on defense. He was always throwing up stupid shots, but that dude was clutch. He would <laughs> make that shot at the end of the game pretty much every time. And it was just like, like you can do this, but you can't do the other stuff so he's a liability in traditional fantasy but in something like what they're doing with top shot now all those guys that are like that that are those clutch players or they have those incredible moments in the you know 10 minutes they play or less that's going to be a revenue generator for the nba and for the players okay the moment i i'm a huge fan of that moment thing it's yeah, kind of something that they do on 2K, on basketball games, where, like, um, they'll make you replay a moment, and you can get um, virtual coins to make your team or players better with that. Is So mm -hmm. that's a very that's a very interesting thing that, yeah, with the fantasy, with, that I feel like that can also bring, yeah, can bring those players you might not hear about as much. Oh, well, the, Derek Jones Jr., well, you're now going to know more because he's going to, you're going to see him, you're going to get points for getting that crazy dunk that he has in the game that he has every other game. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that, yeah that, that, is, that model is built for airplay mode, right? Like that model is built is. for guys that are like that who just, they have these explosive mini moments and maybe play 10 minutes a game. And yeah, that's a way that they could definitively generate some revenue. Yeah. Um, that, that's, uh, that's an incredibly creative and inventive model. The NF, the NBA PA definitely did a great job of picking up on that. I that I just see that as being incredible. It's really smart, right? Like, and it's such um. I think it. I think the NBA needs something like that a little bit, and it's a win win for everybody, right? Because the guys that everybody's already watching, LeBron and all those big names. Like they're they they're not losing anything to let some of these other guys get a little bit of shine in that plot in that system the way they're going to make it work. No, absolutely not. Because the reality is is that a guy like LeBron is going to still shine in yeah. this vehicle because he's going to have plenty of moments as well. And exactly. especially in, again in a sport like the NBA that is so individual driven and uh, individual personalities, you can stand out and. Mm -hmm potentially make build your own brand i just ask dennis rodman ask meta world peace about being able to stand out and build your own brand based on yeah. being that individual uh this fits what the nba is versus you know the nfl where they're selling the shield and they're selling the name you know on the front of the jersey not the name on the back I, right 
this this yeah. perfectly fits what the NBA has been since David Stern was commissioner back in the early eighties. Oh, that's good point with that. Um, okay, well, this point, I think we should switch over now to fast break questions of the week. So we'll start off um, since we had like super team discussion and then also fandoms and stuff. We're going to mix it up with that. Um, so I'll start off with the guest for the Wii Shaka. Uh, who's your favorite super team of all time? My favorite super team of all time. So you can go is... from like the Celtics, 80s, Lakers, 80s, whatever. Absolutely. Whoever has I think... three superstars. I think I'm going to go a little off the board. In that there was a super team that was built by the Los Angeles Lakers, and they acquired Gary Payton and Carl Malone to go with Kobe and Shaq. And the assumption was was that they were the super team and they were going to win the finals. And Ugh. Jade, growing up as a Detroit, Detroit Pistons fan, will appreciate. I like that mm-hmm. super team because Detroit had Chauncey Billups, they had Rip Hamilton, they had Rasheed Wallace, they had Ben Wallace, and them boys went into that final that nobody thought they were going to win and smoked those Lakers with four Hall of Famers on it. And so I, for me, as someone who didn't really like the way that that Lakers team kind of came together because it felt like Gary Payton and Carl Malone were just trying to latch on to get a championship, I love that the Pistons, with those four All-Stars, we able to knock out those Lakers. That's probably my favorite super team ever. Uh, so then, Jade, swing it back over. Who is uh, your favorite super team? Chaka already took it from me. Already took that same one? I was going to say, like, super teams are not really my, my jam. I don't traditionally like the idea of super teams. I like, I'm a little bit of a purist. I like real team basketball. So, like, like, that's why this year my top three favorite teams are Toronto, Dallas, and Miami. I'm not interested in the dynamic duos so much. Although I know technically Dallas is said to be one of them, but Dallas is a pretty rounded, deep team. Oh, they are. Um, And traditionally, like, most people, when you say super team... Most people don't think of that Pistons team. So I definitely appreciate that. <laughs> that, is, that, was, that is a solid team with it. Um, okay, now, so we're now we're going to flip the switch with super teams. Question, least favorite super team, Jade? Boston. You didn't like the Boston Big Three? I didn't like Boston with Paul Pierce because I cannot stand Paul Pierce. You can't stand. You can't stand I the truth. Can't stand him. Oh, you can't I handle the truth, Jake. <laughs> he is a walking. That man is a walking ego. He is. I really don't like his takes on ESPN. I, I don't like him. Every time he's on, I'm like, really, really, dude. Like this is. Ugh. Him yeah. And so Perkins. that's easy. That's an easy one for me. Chaka, who's your <laughs> least favorite? The Heatles. Give me a break. LeBron was supposed to sign with the Knicks that summer, guys. He was supposed to sign with the Knicks. But we waited. We waited. We patiently waited. We saved our money. We did everything right to get LeBron to come to New York. When um, Chris Bosh announced that he was going to sign with Miami, the that afternoon, Madison Square Garden stock went through the roof because everyone was like, oh, there's no way that Miami could afford Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh, and LeBron James. So he's obviously coming to the Knicks. Then he did the whole special, and he didn't come to the Knicks. And I I have, I, I rooted against them for four years. Okay, <laughs> so I have lie. a question. I have a question about that because I wrote about that. Of course, I couldn't write my Knicks series and not write about that. So... When I was looking at the whole thing, I thought to myself, of course LeBron James was never going to go to New York. If you looked at it the way I looked at it, of course hindsight is nice to have. But like, so Knicks fans really thought he was coming. Knicks fans really, really (laughs) thought he was coming. (laughs) And it's funny because you would think that after, like now, again, hindsight is 2020. So now we know that 
those three had had the conversation of getting together. Mm -hmm. uh, but we just felt like we had Carmelo. We just signed Amari Stoudemire. These were guys who were very friendly with that LeBron banana boat contingent. So <laughs> why wouldn't LeBron come play with his boys? Well, See, he did go play with his boys in South Beach instead yeah, of New York City. I was going to say, he still played with his friends. <laughs> I find that interesting because the takes that I had on why, of course, LeBron was never going to come had nothing to do with the fact that a conversation had happened and everything to do with who the Knicks organization already was. And I will say, Jade, that in hindsight, kind of hearing LeBron speak about the Knicks post never signing with them, <laughs> that absolutely makes a lot of sense, right? Like now we understand that there's really no free agent that wants to come to the New York Knicks mm -hmm. as long as James Dolan is the owner. Mm -hmm. At the time, though, because keep in mind, we're talking about how many years ago is that now, guys? That's got to be pushing a decade it's almost. almost mm -hmm. It's almost right? and so, And so uh, with First it being time. that long ago, we were still kind of – in but this you mindset know what? that, hey, we could go get him. We could get him. Maybe he would come. I pulled some things, one, out of that interview he did with Larry King before he met with the Knicks, that I was like, this should have been an indication that you were not going about it the right way. So the one thing was, during that interview, LeBron said that not all money is good money. And then the Knicks' whole thing was that if you play with us, you're going to be a billionaire in this amount of time, they had like this whole, they had a, a financial consultant come in and put together like this timeline, which would have required LeBron to stay with the Knicks for like the next 14 years, by the way. <laughs> so <laughs> that was the first thing that I was like, first of all, your approach was all wrong based on what he said in an interview a month before your meeting. The other thing was, how are you as the Knicks who offered max contracts to the guys you have in the last 10 years who were broken, not going to offer LeBron James a max contract. That's the point you decide you're not going to spend all the money you have available when you're trying to get LeBron James? So as a Knicks fan, going to respond to all that. Number one, Knicks would have totally signed off for LeBron for another 14 years. That would not be a problem. We would have taken him. Number two... But LeBron that, was staying anywhere for 14 years. No, absolutely not. And now we know that in hindsight, right, because he's on his third team since that free agency. Um, but keep in mind that, I mean, no one could have... We couldn't have necessarily predicted that based on the fact that he had spent his whole career in Cleveland, and he had... He re-signed. He re-upped with Cleveland at least once. Yeah, so, he did I mean, seven years. Um, so I and so just But that was the secondary point, really. The main point was that it wasn't gonna be money that was gonna get him, and that was still their main approach and their pitch. Absolutely. And keep in mind that when he makes that bad money comment, that could easily have been about the Cleveland Cavaliers. If you're a Knicks fan looking at that through blue and orange goggles, <laughs> the Cavs could have offered him more money than anyone else, right? So when he starts talking about bad money. Is he talking about us? No, he's talking about the team that could offer him the most money. We couldn't offer him the most money. Oh, by the way, well, neither could Miami, right? Well, we couldn't offer – no one could have offered him more money than the Cavs. That's the bird rights. The Cavs right. had his bird rights. But he so was when he says bad money, maybe he was talking about the Cavs for all we know. I mean, Fair again, enough. this is blue and orange goggles, right? So <laughs> Knicks fans trying to look at it, finding a way that maybe he would come in. Hindsight's twenty twenty. He never came. He's, he was never going to come. It was never really a possibility. Everything that you said is correct, right? We should have seen these signs. There's no reason to not offer him as much money as possible. And we could also point to the fact that he went to Miami and took less money, right? He left money on the table to go there. So, I, I mean... I covered that, too, though, because he took less money to play with Bosch and Wade. I, I just don't think that's the same level as who the Knicks had for him to play with. The talent, I, I, I don't think the talent level was the same. And if it should go wrong in New York, there's a lot more on LeBron James' shoulders than if it goes wrong in Miami. That second point, I'll 100% agree with you on, that if he couldn't have lifted the Knicks to a championship, yeah, especially having not lifted Cleveland to a championship and then having left, that would have been a ding on his legacy. What I will say, though, to your first point, I do, like, if we were objectively, it's hard to do this now because we know what's happened after the fact. 
I don't know that it was a consensus that Carmelo Anthony and Amari Stoudemire at that time were significantly less players than Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh. Dwayne Wade's the only guy in that circle that won a ring. Chris Bosh was in Toronto, and he was a great player in Toronto. But again, he was a part of kind of not really leading Toronto past the first round of the playoffs. Um, Carmelo had a year where he took Denver to the Western Conference Finals. He had a year when he came to the Knicks. We took the Knicks into the second round. Amari Stoudemire went to the Western Conference Finals with Phoenix. I believe that Amari was coming off of some injury stuff, so there's that yep. component. So I that's, don't know. The big, that's my biggest component in it is Stoudemire because his injuries by that were such that they could not get insurance on his missed games anymore Absolutely. by the time they were going after LeBron. Absolutely. So that's obviously something to take into consideration. What I will say is that if we go back and look at that year that Amari had, Amari was an MVP candidate most of that year. So in that one year, he was awesome. And then, you know, then it's the Knicks. The Knicks are the Knicks. And <laughs> so we, we, we just we – I just know that slogan the rest except the mean, Timberwolves. Man. Some, some teams hey. just rest to the mean. We just are who we are. It was yep. my slogan for the Raptors until very recently, too. So I get it. <laughs> wolves will be Wolves. Knicks will be Knicks. Toronto smell you. Has late. a ring. You're not one of us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, not anymore. And but we were. You know we were. <laughs> well, yes, you guys were a much more successful version of that, right? Because you you were still winning. The Knicks, poor Knicks. And the Timberwolves as well. I mean, we just you know, jaded franchises. It is what it is. I'd love to get another Patrick Ewing. I don't think it's going to happen, unfortunately. I, I, I would love to get another Kevin Garnett, and that's definitely not going to happen. <laughs> There's no one is crazy enough in the league to be like that, that's still that talented. He was, he talked trash to himself. <laughs> <laughs> he would. He talked trash to himself. If you ever saw him talking, it was him talking to himself. Guy would hit his head on the stanchion before the games and stuff. Like he was, he was one of a kind. <laughs> for, that's, very, uh, sure. that's a very diplomatic way to put it. <laughs> okay, well, we hit up all the stuff we went to, and then went on a whole other tangent too, which is what we do best here at Hardcore <laughs> Honeys. Um, like to say uh, thank Chaka for coming in this week. Helping out. It's always great to have you here with us. It was great. Finally, for me at least, finally able to record with you. <laughs> I appreciate thing. it. So I think um, always a welcome guest for you, uh, for us. Absolutely. Always, always a welcome guest. But okay, so Jade, we got, we got Chaka here. And then I just want to make sure all subscribers, I do want to throw out a thank you for them, for, for you guys, for listening to deal with all our audio stuff that we've had. I know at the beginning it was a little bit, but we're all new to this. We're figuring it out. But thanks for still listening to us, supporting us. Um, so follow us on the Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all that social media stuff, and make sure you also do that for um, Belly Up too, because they got all that great stuff going out. We got Jade and Chaka also writing articles in there. Hopefully I can start doing that back again. Get to also, that. Chaka's got... Uh, a podcast as well. Okay, sure. Plug in for your <laughs> podcast then, Chaka. Absolutely. So the pod is called F in Sports. I am a teacher when I'm not podcasting and writing. And I have a buddy of mine, Parker Ainsworth, who's also a teacher. We are two teachers who grade sports' biggest issues. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at F in Sports 2. You can catch us on Instagram at F underscore in underscore sports. Like, subscribe, share, do all that wonderful stuff. We try to put out an episode every Monday. And anywhere that you listen to pods, you can hear us. Oh, that's great. I'll have to make sure to, to subscribe to that. Okay. Well, thanks for everything, you guys. I'm going to be signing off. Jade, Chaka, TJ here. Um, see you guys next episode. Peace out. <laughs>